We ready, Mike? Let us know when you're up. Hey, good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's board meeting. If we could please all rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We'll move right into the superintendent's report. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you much. Thank you for joining us tonight, and thank you for watching us online. A uh, couple of updates uh, before I get into my budget and return to learn presentation. Um, Ulster County has changed its approach on how they are going to be doling out the uh, vaccinations for uh, the instructional staff. So educational staff right now qualifies to get vaccinated through Ulster County. Um, um, uh, Department of Health and other sources too, but the Ulster County Department of Health has uh, worked with superintendents to allot a certain number of vaccine slots each week now to each school district. And uh, we rolled out our first uh, batch of 15 slots to our educators that are interested in getting vaccinated. And um, I know that there's a lot of relief on a number of educators' minds that they are now in the queue, so to speak, for getting vaccinated. In our data gathering of uh, getting names and email addresses of those that are interested in being vaccinated, we're also seeing that a good number of our current staff are already in the process of being vaccinated. The group 1B, which is the educational group, um, actually opened up a month ago next week. So next week begins the first groupings of group 1B to get their second shot in the two shot, uh, the two dose uh, vaccination for the uh, Moderna vaccine or the Pfizer vaccine. So uh, we're very happy that we can provide that link to our staff through the Department of Health and we're very appreciative of the Department of Health and specifically uh, Deputy County Executive Mark Ryder in putting together the program and working with superintendents so we can get our staff vaccinated. We see that as a path towards uh, returning to learn in the long run when we can see our staff vaccinated and see the benefits of that as a society that our children can come to school more often more frequently with our teachers vaccinated so we hope that the new york state department of health keeps pace with regulations and realities here so there's a lot of pressure coming from superintendents through the local department's health and then up to the state department of health that we need to start planning on what does our world in education look like in a vaccinated world and also as our scientific community, our medical community knows and learns an awful lot more about how to deal with COVID. And we certainly um, hope that the Department of Health understands we can't do these things last minute again. There's an opportunity here to help us prepare for what September is going to look like all indications are that a vast majority of Americans that want a COVID vaccination will have that COVID vaccination in their bodies by this summer. So educators everywhere, including me, need to make sure we put a lot of pressure on those decision makers in Albany and in Washington to give us the proper guidelines and the proper latitude to allow us to open up our schools in September in a normal way. So with that, I'll get off my soapbox <laughs> and move into our return to learn update today. Mike, do you have that up? <coughs> Thank you. So now that we're fully into the budget or, or getting ourselves into the budget process, I'm blending our budget development and our re return to learn work. So just a couple of quick updates. First of all, the Board of Education at our uh, uh, impromptu meeting on Friday night, um, as a requirement of the Department of Health, approved the return for two of our sports programs, which were designated as high-risk sports. Uh, that's our basketball program and our cheerleading program. 
And I just want the board to know that we have begun working with our athletes this week in those sports, um, in conditioning and practicing, preparing for competition. Um, and as we start to see those competitions uh, bear some fruit, I will keep the board apprised and certainly watch the newspaper because I'm sure they can't wait to fill up the back pages of the papers with, uh, with headlines on, uh, on high school sports. Um, returning. So now I want to make sure I'm, I'm, I'm noting this too. We already have some sports that are already underway. Our track program for winter was not a high risk sport, so that's certainly underway. Um, and we're very excited that our kids are starting to get more and more active. So the Board of Education properly and rightfully asked me a simple question What other things can we do in person? So the natural progression is let's look at our extracurricular activities. So absolutely, the answer is yes. Our extracurricular activities can return to in-person work. And what I'm, what I'm putting to the board is that we would like to work with our principals, our student leaders in each of the clubs, the advisors and our transportation department so that we can figure out which clubs want to meet in person, which clubs can meet in person? Is it fully in person or is there some hybrid piece to it because there are some students that participate, maybe they participate fully online. So coming into an in-person program might be a challenge for them. So I think this is kind of a unique opportunity to allow those clubs to learn the experience of how to meet challenges and needs within their own club organization. So uh, we're pretty excited about authorizing the, um, the clubs to get going on it. Of course, we have to continue to uh, meet all the COVID protocols. The 50 person limit is still a limit within the regulations and rules outlined by the government uh, through Albany. Um, so we uh, absolutely have no problem living up to those requirements and any of those things that do get uh, relaxed, we will make sure our clubs and activities know, but we're a go. So. After tonight, I will be uh, giving a thumbs up to our principals and, and our clubs and working with our transportation department where there's the need for a late bus. Um, let's get going. Let's get some clubs going in person so, where those clubs can pull those pieces together. So great stuff. So Mike, when we do that, can we Mike. find Joanne, do you need to turn a microphone on and pull it closer, please? It is. Okay. Sorry, Mike, so with the clubs, can we find out how many will be hybrid and or how many are in, are in each club? Uh, mean, we I sent out the, uh, the list of the, all the clubs a couple meetings ago. Yes. I, I don't have those numbers off the top of my, uh, with time, yeah. This is not going to be something that's going to happen this week. Uh -huh. It's going to take weeks to get these things going. So as those things develop, I'll pull together information. Yeah, because it, it would be, this way we kind of like have an idea um because i mean if we only have a club with two people in it i mean is we, it we may have a club, club with two people in it uh, that's a different question than getting things going because those right. clubs are happening right now there might be a club with two people in it in a virtualized approach that's different than authorizing in person not are you saying that you want to turn those clubs off um, I don't know. I mean, that's a different it, conversation. It's going to hold that would different, have to be right. That's a whole different right. conversation. But it would be light, nice to know that. I mean, even if we have in person and the kids are um, hybrid, ones that are staying home or still joining in, it would like it would be nice to know that we have five kids in class and two online. As soon as I can get that information, it's not happening yet. So okay. it'll be maybe weeks before I have something like that. So yeah, we'll, it, we'll see if we can pull together. Definitely a positive thing. Karen, Karen. Um, yes, I, I just I wanted to mention about the clubs. Um, my own child is very involved in sports usually before the pandemic. And I have to tell you with the sports being shut down, the clubs were a saving grace for her. She joined Spanish club and she joined FCCLA and she's been active in both. And that's a world she would have never been able to explore if um, sports were going on still. So I have to say thank you for that. And I, uh, I wanna also say with the high risk sports, I didn't expect her to wanna do the sports, but she signed up and she's going to do um, basketball. Oh. And um, it's the first glimmer I've seen in her eye in a year of excitement. 
and I want to thank the board as a, a parent for um, opening that up because I think that's my avenue of getting her to come back to school full, to, to a hybrid. So that's thank wonderful. you very much for that. And, and I think that we need to look at that, that even though the clubs, they might not have high attendance, they might not have the normal kids exploring them that would, and it provided them with a unique opportunity that ordinarily they wouldn't have had. That's wonderful, thank you. John? I think the, just to re uh, reiterate your point, Mike, I, to, to, it, in, in response to what Joanne was saying, I think the, the real, uh, w what we're saying right now is each club now gets to say, yes, we can do after school activities, we can do in person, and we might even have bus support to do it. So let's each figure out what's the best model. And the more than likely you're gonna keep a hybrid because some people are just gonna have to do it from home. And we do it, if we can do it for classrooms, for regular instruction, we could do it for clubs. So I think, the point is, no matter how many kids are in a club, everyone's going to have a uh, have the ability to decide as a group what's the best way so everybody can participate. There's yeah. a lot of logistics, right? Kids are in school different days, so staying after school creates challenges. Right. Some people can't come in to be in person if they're not in school already, and so on. So, I think it's great that we have the option. They all have the option to figure it out what works best and. You know, there's going to be there's going to be some challenges. Things like drama club and, and chorus, where you have performances and you have big groups, it's going to be a little different than a group with 10 people or less right. doing uh, any given any of the many clubs we have. So I think it's great that we're going to do that, and I really hope every one of them comes up with the best idea. That because to 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 Karen's point, the clubs are really uh, it's at least people have clubs if they're not into sports or their sport isn't active. The kids to, need to it. participate, and I, I, I definitely, definitely think it's the best thing we can do. So I appreciate that, Mike. That well, you guys are making the effort. Mike, I realize we're uh, less than a week in, into this from the time we, we voted, um, but um, do we <clears throat> are we aware of any uh, insurance changes? For example, I mean, I realize there's probably going to be increased costs, but what about procedural changes, especially where high risk sports are concerned? Um, you know, I was just thinking that, uh, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, some of the high-risk sports, even basketball perhaps, they may be required to wear masks. Um, do we then have to employ you know, special masks because wearing paper and, you know, you're, you're breathing heavy, whatever you wind up, you know, that could cause more harm than, than, than uh, do good. Um, has the, have the insurance companies given us any direction and what that added cost might be? Yeah, so there's no, uh, no impact on insurance. The, the program that you folks approved Friday night and the um, guidelines issued by the Department of Health were reviewed by insurance. And since it's not a contract with the county, it's an insured event. So they're <coughs> just, it's just sports. It's not a special sport that we have to have a contract and a rider with um, for an insurable event. So it's fully in, they're, they're fully insured events under our current insurance program. Right, and you're not aware of any any special, um, uh, you know, equipment that's going to be required. Oh, or anything there like might that be. I, I just am not necessarily aware. It may be roses, but the athletic department is authorized within their budget to purchase whatever equipment they need okay. to, um, in order to to get things going. So, Rose. So the athletic department did purchase masks for the players as well as um, additional PPE. Um, thermometers so that every team, every coach had a thermometer, um, sanitizer, and some barriers for, um, John is going to be upset for with the me, stat, I can't For the it. stats table. Yes, yeah. <laughs> the, score, the scorekeepers right. and the statisticians. So. They're going to be putting up plastic barriers between the stats, the statisticians at the, at the scorers table? Because yeah, you can't spread that table out, there's no room. <laughs> Yeah, Mike. Uh, just one more thing. Um, you know, typically with uh, um, you know, last year when, when uh, I was at um, one of the final basketball games, uh, we held a senior night that involved the parents and students, and it was really a, a, a nice, classy event, I thought. Um, is, is that something that we uh, are considering? Yeah, we are. Okay. Yeah, I know that, uh, that Jonna and, and the crew is, is working on some unique ways to approach those experiences. We want to we want to try to have those experiences in as uh, full a fashion as possible within the guidelines that we have to follow. So yeah, absolutely. That's a, a, a time-honored tradition that we want to continue. So I know they're working hard on how to do that. Great. I'm all for it. Okay. Mike. Okay. So another follow-up item uh, 
the Board of Education asked to take a look at teacher sub rates a few meetings ago. The Board of Education authorized a, um, an increase in our minimum wage to $15 an hour. So um, on the slide that's up on the screen and in the PowerPoint presentations that you have in front of you, um, I also gave the uh, Board of Education just some general statistics. Um, I had the 1920, it's a little bit more, it was a little fuller than this chart. So this chart will develop out for 2021 um, over the, the coming uh, months, right after our um, last meeting when you'd asked it, I asked BOCES to update that for 2021. And what you have in front of you is, is, uh, is, is really just kind of a regional look, but um, currently a certified substitute in our, a substitute teacher in our school district gets $100 a day. A non-certified teaching substitute gets $80 a day. A typical day for us is a seven hour work day for our substitutes. So if $15 an hour was the minimum, is that what you're gonna build the base on? A um, uh, $15 day, a $15 an hour for seven hours is $105. So it would make sense that that would be the minimum if we were gonna follow that logic for a non-certified teacher as the minimum of $15 an hour, and then some new rate above that for the differentiation between certified and uncertified for the certified teacher. And I am open to any direction that the board wants to go there. Um, well, we, we should really do this under old business. Right, we, can, we, I'm just we should do you it, some data yeah. right now, and we can do that under old business as, a, as, a, as an action item if right. you want. So um, it's not, it's, it, there's really it's pretty black and white it's just a matter of the board having the discussion and we absolutely are not required to act on that tonight so i don't want the board to feel pressured that this is something we have to do we work at the pleasure of whatever the board ends up deciding through discussion so um it's the basic information there you go and we can we can take some action if you so choose uh, during old business all right so getting into some more of the budget items um, we're still targeting a 0% increase on our top line budget. Um, I think that it's important for us to show our public that we can it control our, um, our costs. And this is also a strategy to reduce the amount of fund balance that we need to appropriate on an annual basis. So I'm absolutely confident that this is something we can deliver. Some of the considerations as we're building the budget, the strategy that we're working on is reviewing all existing expenses and departments. Obviously this year has been an odd year in so many ways, including working through a budget, but we are still spending our time looking at things very carefully to make sure that we plan for what 21, 22 will be. Some of the drivers for costs, salaries and benefits, our transportation contract is something that is in the process of being renewed for the 21-22 school year. Obviously, we're paying very close attention to what happens at the state and federal level when it comes to fe uh, uh, our final state aid amounts. We have indication from the um, State Education Department that initially, actually from the governor's office, initially the 20% aid cut was going to be down to a 5% aid cut. We have recent communication from the state education department that's that's going to be a zero percent aid cut but they don't have the numbers for us yet nor the mechanism for making that payment that payment typically would come to us in march so i will obviously keep you posted that's aid for current year we're also watching for how things develop out between the federal government and the state government as you uh, may recall from my uh, last presentation the new york state um, Governor, Governor Cuomo has made a request to the federal government for $15 billion in aid from the federal government to fill a significant budget gap that exists in, um, in New York State. And if the state gets that $15 billion, there will be a significant change in our aid package. Our current aid package that the governor has proposed is actually a net decrease of over $100,000 year to year and that's not good. We need a significant increase. Um, some other areas that are some cost drivers and we're waiting for annual reviews. So this will be something that we'll be updating in our budget documents 
right up through the end our costs for our BOCES programs, special education and regular education programs through BOCES, um, and certainly our enrollment for in and out of district uh, programs. So those are some of the, the broader topics that, um, that we are working on through a budget process. Getting into some more fine tuning as we are progressing, I just want to keep the board kind of apprised as to some of the areas that are going to be developed and part of our public discourse um, that might be a good, uh, a good time for discussion at our March meeting, because our next February meeting, we're going to be solely focused on a Vision 2020 update from our construction management team and our architect. So the meeting after that's March 11th. So right now, the way that it's looking, and I'm sure that this list is going to be changed in a month, but we have some additional costs that we need to figure out how we build into a zero-based budget. Annual student device replacement. We are now a K-12 one-to-one district. Our kindergartners have iPads, grades one through 12 all have Chromebooks. Our desire is to have all students K through 12 have Chromebooks next school year. Um, a strategy that we're approaching is that we're going to need to replace about 25% of our Chromebook fleet annually. So then every four years you have a new fleet, so to speak. There's a rotation there as opposed to all of a sudden we've got to come up with a thousand Chromebooks or something along those lines. So we need to build in a budget line of approximately $170,000. The approach that we're going to do so we can get things moving properly is we're going to make that purchase now in current budget so that those Chromebooks come in this spring and summer so that they are ready for deployment in the fall for when our students return in September. So the money that we build into the 21-22 budget would be a specific line designated for Chromebook replacement that would be used in February of 22. So that we're always buying in the winter for the following fall because of what we saw with the lead time necessary to buy the Chromebooks this past year. Um, smart board replacement project is something we'll dig into some detail on in March but a significant portion of our smart boards will be replaced over the next two to three years. A good amount of that money is going to be coming out of the Smart Schools Bond Act. But as much as we would like to wish that the Smart Schools Bond Act was an unending pot of money, there is an end to that pot. So in order for us to finish out the replacement of smart boards, um, we're going to need to come up with $320,000. Whether that's something we strategize to do over two years or three years is something that will be part of our dialogue here as a board. And it quite honestly does depend an awful lot about where we end up with fund balance and where we end up with our aid package. Um, we will need to make some updates and repairs to our planetarium. Um, it's a wonderful facility that is used extensively by our astronomy program by our first through fifth graders, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Cub Scouts, and our uh, adult ed program use the planetarium. And it, like everything, has some age to it. So there's some need for hardware and software upgrades. And we are um, actually, because of weather, there were some cancellations with a uh, proprietary contractor that comes up and does planetarium work. I think they're from down near the Philadelphia area. Uh, but they're going to be coming up to assess our system and make some recommendations and give some options as far as uh, what we can do to uh, keep that facility um, in tip-top shape. Uh, I think there's going to be some significant dialogue about reinstituting the social worker position at the elementary school. As you know, the position was vacated last spring into this school year. We uh, strategy, from a strategy perspective, we chose not to fill that in the spring, and we assessed during the school year this year that we would hold off on filling that. Um, that has been a challenge at the elementary school with one social worker and a part-time guidance counselor in the building. 
So uh, that will be part of our dialogue to refill that position. It is already in the existing budget, so that money has not been removed from the budget. So technically right now we're getting some savings from not doing that, but I want to make sure that the board understands that we need to have a dialogue about whether we should fill that for September or not. Um, considering new, new position requests from principals, that is actually kind of a bucket that's very vague right there. I think you'll see some discussion in the March meetings about what types of positions should we have that are for new programming that principals may want. But also, I think we're going to need to do some stopgap work on, um, on helping children return and pick back up if there's need for additional supports. Um, most recently, we did that work with our early primary grade, uh, first and second grade, with the additional AIS and special, um, I'm sorry, teaching assistant. So I think there will be significant dialogue and um, picture framing around that concept in the March meetings. Um, as I had said, there is an indication from the State Education Department that we will not see a current year aid cut, which is very good. Very good, excuse me. Um, and I know this board, uh, after some dialogue, especially with the Finance Committee, is very interested in really looking very closely at our tax levy and our long-term long financial planning to see is there something we can do in our long-term financial planning to impact in a positive way by reducing our tax levy and by doing so not hurt us in the long term for a financial trajectory. So. Um, we'll prepare for that dialogue too so that the board can have the discussion, get the facts, get the information, and make some decisions on how you want to proceed with that. Um, also, at the last meeting, the Board of Education, after a uh, significant discussion in uh, executive session, approved a five-year deal with Roston Power Generation. It's pending board of the town of Newburgh board approval and Roston's approval, um, not the tax side, the CBA side. So we're waiting on their final s signature prior to me signing it. I thought it was supposed to happen last Monday. They, they approved the tax one, not the CBA, which is why we hold back signatures, because that's what the board's action was to not sign until everything is packaged. So um, when that does go through, and there's no indication to think that it's not, the school district will net over five years $2.8 million of additional revenue. Um, it is a win-win, and that is a very good thing for us in the long run. Essentially what it means is that Roston is going to be pay paying the school district through a community benefit agreement um, additional money on top of their taxes each year for the next well, we already got some this year, so for the next four years out. So uh, it's a very good development, and it churns into the dialogue about what our finances look like over the long run. So I just wanted to whet your appetite a little bit about some of the pretty hefty items that will be part of our dialogue in, in March, and hopefully we'll know an awful lot more about the landscape for aid. I don't know if we'll know a actual number, but we may see some movement at the federal government level and what that package looks like. Some of you may have heard and watched some of the headlines about a $1.9 trillion federal package that includes aid to states. If that goes through as is, Governor Cuomo is assured that he will be getting a significant uptick in the amount of money that the state gets from the federal government, which will trickle down to municipalities and school districts. So March proves to be a very interesting month for us, folks. Right. Sure. Okay. I, I just have one question. This past snowstorm that we had, yeah. um, a significant amount of snow, 
and it, I'm not on the facilities committee, so forgive me if this is something that's already been addressed, but I was wondering, like the snow equipment that we have, is there a cycle for replacement for that? And I also wanted to say our, 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 our maintenance, our grounds, our custodians, they did a wonderful job of getting um, the schools in shape, and I want to thank them for that. But I also wanted to find out, are these guys have the equipment they need, and is it replaced um, like periodically as well? Because we don't get these big snowstorms, but we do get snow. And I've never really, looking through the contracts, I, I started looking through the past budgets, and I didn't see a budget line for that. So I was wondering how that's addressed. Yeah, that would be, it depends upon the piece of equipment. Some equipment is actually equipment because of the cost, so it falls in an equipment line, and Larry mm -hmm. has an equipment line. Some okay. of it actually is technically a supply because of how much it costs. And he's got full authority to buy the things that he needs and to rent the things that he needs. Um, we were in a unique situation for the storm because not, not only was it a significant storm, obviously, um, you know, there were some personnel challenges and um, we fully authorized them if he needed to hire contractors to help him out, do so. So if you needed some bobcat assistance or some backhoes or whatever you need to move the stuff, do it. So when it comes to that, Larry um, and his crew, thank you. Um, they do what it takes to get our schools open. So uh, whether he and I are having that conversation in the evening or at 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the morning, he knows that the drive and desire is we need to get the kids back in school as quickly as possible, even if it means a short delay, but we don't want to have snow days just because there's a flurry. Right. We want to we get our kids back in school. Um, I think that I've um, gained a reputation of being a little stingy on the snow days, and some of our students um, make sure I know that. So um, I apologize, students, but school matters, kids. So let's get ourselves in school. And uh, in our district, if we don't use the snow days, do they, they get them back at the end of the year, or do they depends. just? It depends. It depends. Uh, we have a couple of contracts that a school year cannot be more than 183 school days. Okay. So if we have, um, we've used two snow days. So we started with 187, so we're down to 185 right now. So uh, two more snow days, and we're at water level. Um, okay. About half of my years here, there have been givebacks, half not. It really depends upon the year. Uh, there's a lot of winter in front of us, folks. There, there's an awful lot left here. So yeah. having five snow days in the bank right now is, is not a bad thing. Nope. So. Um, I'm saying six more weeks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The groundhog said six more weeks. So. So really, I just wanted to give kind of a map to what, um, uh, and pique your interest really for what. March proves to be for us, and um, and it will be uh, you know will be a robust discussion because um, somehow we're going to have to figure out how to build things into the budget and also keep our budget limited, and and that's the biggest challenge for us. And it's a it's a revenue game. I'm telling you, this board and and this administration is working as hard as we can to build revenues in in as many ways as possible. Now, Mr. Connors has talked about some ideas that he's got for building some revenue. This action with Roasten builds some revenue. Um, this community needs to have Dan's Camera rebuild project happen. Um, I would imagine over the next several months, going into the fall, definitely, this Board of Education will need to get involved at the state level in seeing that Dan's Camera gets approved. This Board of Education has never taken a position on the environmental elements of Dan's Camera. This Board of Education has 100% taken a position through the entire Dan's Camera rebuilding project that from a fiscal perspective, Dan's Camera has got to be rebuilt and then restructured as a tax and pay much more revenue in that process. The nightmare for Marlboro is that if that project does not get approved for a rebuild, with time, Dan's camera will die an iron death, and so will its revenue. And that's not a good thing for the taxpayers of Marlboro. Right next door is Roasten, which also can die an iron death of rust and age, like many of us, I guess. Um, 
and that's not a good thing either. So I guess the ideal long-term vision from a taxpayer's perspective was both of those plants be retooled to be modern, efficient, forward-thinking power generators and good payers to our revenue stream. We need that, folks. Between those two properties, we get between four and five million dollars a year. If those two properties go away, we lose that revenue. So, um, important, very important. Bless you. Uh, just to move on, then, boilerplate stuff here. The governor's proposed current proposed budget aid package for us is actually a net decrease of one hundred forty-one thousand dollars. That's not acceptable, obviously, and we will be lobbying as recently as tonight. The Ulster County, I'm sorry, the Orange County School Boards Association had an online meeting with uh, Senator Scoofus. Um, Senator Scoofus knows that we believe the approach that the state has taken hurts Marlboro in the development of foundation aid because of the way that the calculation is done with our power plants. He's keenly aware of Marlboro's situation there, and um, we will make sure that he. Um, has all the information he needs to help fight for that. As far as the tax cap, we're still working on calculating the potential levy, so that's TBD, but again, that is going to be a discussion point for this Board of Education. Will we go to the tax cap? Or will we be under the tax cap? I don't think this board has ever considered in my time here going over the tax cap. And I don't think that I would come to the table recommending ever going over the tax cap. And quite honestly, folks, we don't need to go over the tax cap. If you remember just three or four years ago, we actually had a negative tax cap. So those were some problematic years, but we made it through. Um, we're in a much better position right now. So I think that the discussion about where our tax levy is going to end up is going to be a good discussion and with that more to come we've got some meetings that are coming up in february march and april focusing on vision 2020 some budget discussions we're going to weave into that program reviews with ms hecht and our principals um first meeting of april we'll start considering in private session our tenure review for staff by april 22nd we need to adopt our budget and vote on the BOCES budget and believe it or not, today there was a webinar with our election people and the county election officials on preparing for the May votes. So indications right now are things are going to go back to normal for the voting process. But that's from a legislative perspective and a rules perspective that exists. The governor can change that at any time, but that's the um, expectation right now and we'll keep you uh, we'll keep you apprised and with that i have nothing else to report okay uh ulster Bosi's report um we had a meeting last thursday um and it was a legislative session uh had the opportunity senator scoofus was on um assemblyman jacobson was on so both of our representatives were on it in addition to a whole host of others that normally attend uh, it was actually nice because we got more because it was virtual. So for them, it was easier to get from one meeting to another. Um, you know, and everybody's got the same concerns. Um, mental health issues, funding for all these other programs that need, but we drove home the point of it's great to have extra things and they really need to do more, but we need to get our foundation aid fixed so that we're getting our fair share rather than 59% of what we're supposed to be getting because that would be a huge, huge fix for the taxpayers. Um, so, and I, then was another, we was on the call today with the legislative. Uh, it's good to hear that Senator Scoofa says the same exact thing in both meetings. He's very upfront and honest about everything that's going on. Um, you know, what, plan shouldn't plan on happening um so it was uh it was good 
Um, that that the meeting was long. It, it but uh, that's all we discussed was the legislative agenda. Karen, the uh, orange ulster boces. Yep, we met last night. It was a um, 7 uh, p.m. to 10 p.m. Um, some of the topics that uh, highlighted, just to let you know, there were 25 people in attendance. Um, there was a person from every of the, one of the 18 districts um, in Orange County. So uh, some dist districts had two representatives there. Um, the top things that came up, Board of Election, which you had um, mentioned, petitions, they want signatures this year and they, they're, not, they're not prepared to do digital signatures. Um, how many is going to be an issue if they do traditionally and follow last year's um, budget vote was unprecedented with how many. So uh, they're trying to push for um, numbers from the 2019 vote. Uh, vote is most likely going to be in person. There will be absentee ballots and there will be a slot for, for COVID that you can mark off, but um, they're not going to be sent to all. Um, there, we also, one of the nice things about the Orange County School Boards Association is now we have, um, uh, we have a representative from our area, District 9, on um, the Resolution Committee, the Awards Committee, and the uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee from our districts, which is nice. Um, we have uh, the New York State School Board member event coming up. It's going to be May 19th, 2021. It's virtual. Um, it's a, uh, a, 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 like a kind of um, new member event for those elected and those that are already members. Um, New, York, uh, New York State School Boards Association Conference 2021 um, is going to be in New York City and it's going to be in person. They've changed the dates. It's going to be Sunday, October 24th, Monday, October 25th, and Tuesday, October 26th. I see some of you guys writing copious notes. I sent this last night when the meeting was over, so you have these all in your, um, your, your, your uh, email. Um, prospective board members for our public, uh, if you're going to plan on running for office, there's informational meetings run by OXBA, um, Saturday, March 20th, it's virtual, it's in Saturday morning, um, and then there's one Tuesday night, March 23rd, which is also virtual. Um, there's also the legislative brochures out, it's like a 23-page document, their brochures, um, and there's a kind of like Cliff Notes version two, two of it, which you can get right off of the, the website. Um, basically, we're trying to prioritize, um, get kids back into school five days a week next year, um, consistent and on a regular basis. Um, not a given, it's not given that schools will be back to normal next year, five days a week. It's, um, some are believing that it's still gonna be very similar to what we're in right now. Um, we need to get money to help the kids get past the COVID um, uh, gap in programming, money to um, get more space in schools so they can operate safely, rent what they need space-wise, uh, money to help kids with stress and mental health and teachers with stress and mental health. Um, also, um, Shelly Mayer, she's a member of the New York State Senate, um, Democrat Yonkers. Um, she was talking, uh, they, they gave some updates to Oxba. And she had mentioned that there's curriculum bills for the first time actually coming up through the legislature that we need to watch for. Um, the curriculum legislation is being proposed, um, and it's also mental health and um, mental support uh, and support services that are being proposed. Um, but her main goal is to get the kids back to school safely. Uh, Oxba delegates. This is what we want. Um, we don't want to go back to normal. We want to go back to better. And that's a bit like the mantra that we're trying to use. Learn from this and make it a better and safer environment. Um, there was a tip sheet that was given out for meeting with legislatures and follow-ups. And um, the other thing that we found is um, our meetings, usually when we were face-to-face, um, -face, didn't have that much attendance. And since we've gone virtual for OXBA, it's, um, we've had more than 25, 30 people show up at most meetings. So we found that virtual meetings, we get more of attendance and more input uh, in our, but that also makes our meetings longer. Um, so this is some of the concerns that the districts voiced, which I thought were kind of interesting and we might want to hear. Um, we still have places in Orange County, not all homes have internet or have internet access to that they can get internet. Um, sports, you, they either, the, the delegates either loved it or they hated the idea. Um, those that loved it tended to have my, my 
point of view that it's more school, schooling is more than academics, it's your extracurriculars, whether it's sports, band, um, arts, whatever. Um, it's amazing how much teachers, these are some of the quotes that they made, it's amazing how much teachers actually do in their jobs, they never realized this until the pandemic hit. Um, we uh, need to fund the kids what they need and um, need to focus on funding, which is what we're all agreeing to. Um, one of the concerns that one of the board members brought up is most educators are working over 14 hour days, seven days a week, and they're afraid of burnout. Um, another stress that the teachers don't feel safe uh, in Orange County, they don't have what we have with the 15 shots and vaccines that Ulster County is doing. That's not being done in Orange County. So that's really something nice to know that we're getting here and that that's happening for us. Um, this was big, this was big on my radar. Some districts are getting rid of the fully remote days like we have on Monday, and they're making that a return, uh, back to a turn a learning day, and they're alternating the weeks now as to what cohort attends on each, each Monday or whatever their day is. Um, one big question that came up, and I really never thought of this until the person said it, is um, why is it okay to play sports after school, but not able to play gym during school? Um, then um, one of the other school districts brought up that if they're going to do sports, why not make all of the athletes virtual so that this way they won't affect that Goshen brought this up so that this way the athletes don't affect both cohorts. They're virtual as long as they're playing for that month. And a couple of other districts are thinking of doing that too. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, Spectators is an issue. Um, there's they're some they're not sure if parents really should be watching or not. So some of them are trying to make any kind of practices or games virtual. Uh, you brought up the 5% reduction aid. That uh, was a letter that came out to um, NYSED on the second. That we're it looks like we're getting a 5% back. Um, another per, another group brought up one of the um, people that's an attorney as well as a board member mentioned that the waiver is tricky with um, to legal and it's hard to legally enforce for athletics because um, they said that not all, all the time people understand what the waivers what they're signing off on um, And then another person brought up that um, the vaccines, this, was a, this is a medical professional that's on a board. Uh, vaccines are not approved yet for kids under 18 and um, sports is a tough decision to, to go or not. And it's probably gonna be at least another year or two until um, vaccines are approved for kids. And that's pretty much what they, and it was kind of, it was kind of welcoming to see you know, some of the concerns we had. And it was eye-opening to hear some of the different points of view than what we've come across as well. Thanks, Karen. And the big thing, Mike is giving each one of us a copy. Um, when we're talking to legislators, you know, the, the both Ulster and Orange Ulster have their priorities. Mm -hmm. We have this real, you know, couple pages of the, the big items that we need to be hounding all the time. So all our elected officials, um, we should really stay focused on those that are specific to us. Because it's hard when you're in those large groups, you know, whether it's OU BOCES or Ulster BOCES, you know, everybody's got, it's hard to come together around a true uh, unifying thing because, you know, it's like foundation aid. Fixed foundation aid for us, there's many districts that don't want to touch it because they're already 100%. So you start messing with the formula, they may lose money. So. What was nice too is the executive director of Oxbaugh was going to um, follow up any of the meetings she was in and the district she was in, um, highlighting the points later on. Yeah, no, they, I was on the call today with Scoofus oh, okay. and... Um, that committee, it's the same when we did the Senate, the, the uh, state conference one. Um, they're real good work. Everybody's really trying hard to hammer home um, wherever we can. And you got to, you know, although uh, Martucci doesn't cover our area, we obviously have a, a working relationship with him from when, you know, he came, brought his company to us to work with. So I, I'm not bashful at all at picking up the phone and calling him and hounding him about trying to help us out. And he's been very open. Um, the people from OU Bosu is like, well, why do you want to be on that conference call? That's not your area. It's because we know him and we want to keep hounding him about it. <laughs> um, so, okay. Uh, public comment on the agenda items. Mike, anything? <laughs> okay. Um, we'll move to the consent agenda. 
Resolved that the Board of Education, upon the recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools, approves the contracts, agreements, and reports as presented. Personnel recommendations, Vision 2020 change orders, second read and adoption of policies 7131 and 8260, donation and budget increase. Can I have a motion? Motion. James, second. Karen. Any just questions? Again, I'm just going to ask for the public's information. The Vision 2020 um, changes. Can Roseanne, can you explain those this way? The change orders? There's quite a bit there. Um, well, there's only really, a, it's not, a, there's two major ones. Yeah, but as a point of order, I, I think we discussed this the last time. If we're going to change the process that we do this, these discussions are so if we have questions to discuss amongst us, before we vote on something. Well, Frank. The documents are all there, and if there's questions, that's what we're all here for. Uh -huh. So do you have a specific so question again, about a the, specific the public, item? The, the, you know what? Our community voted this in, and they should also have the right to know what's going on. And not it, it doesn't always go up on site. It's just not about us just saying yes or no. I mean, I don't think there's a big deal of explaining um, the changes. But that's not the point of the consent agenda. Mm. Well, I had also asked that maybe we should start separating the consent agenda again because we can't seem to, you know. And, and, and my understanding well. is from reviewing the, the uh, minutes of the meeting that I wasn't at, the video, that uh, didn't get approved. Correct. So I'm asking questions. Okay, so what, what, what is your specific question that you need addressed? Right. Why did we change them and why are they getting changed? I mean, $22,000 concrete level. I mean, so do we not put this before the facilities committee first or we're we just going to bring it to the board? I mean, that's fine. We're following the policy on change orders that was adopted by the board when this, this, this was put together that even though the superintendent has the ability to approve change orders, is still at to a certain level they're going to be brought to us as a whole mike i, I think what joanne might be asking for is just a, a summary review of uh, of what the change orders were i, I don't think anybody's debating that the um, uh, superintendent didn't have the authority to affect Correct. those changes but if he could just give a cursory review of what actually happened that'd be great right i have no problem doing that if, if we could just for helping me out a little bit if there's a specific item that anyone wants to me to include in my RTL so I can do a presentation because when we put things into the consent agenda we don't prepare detailed presentations okay. so that it's not about not wanting to give the information Joanne right. I can just read down it so there are five change orders in the first section um, three are connected to the four are connected to the middle school one is connected to the high school all of them are detail oriented specific items one of them deals with the retaining wall modification another gets into the grading behind the retaining wall um, another one gets into electrical work and a feeder modification uh, at the high school and that would be the electrical feed another one gets into specifics about the univentilator piping and that's a zero cost change and another one gets into a masonry partition, and that's a zero cost, cost change. change. The you. specifics about each one of those no. can be looked at in the documents that are uploaded on the website. And again, I have no problem if there's any item on the entire agenda that anyone wants to have highlighted in my RTL, just let me know ahead of time so I can prepare for it. Right. And I absolutely will do that. Right. Thank you. Sorry about that, Mike. No problem. No problem right. at all. I just, like I said, uh, it's just something that, you know, changes that people need to know understand you know because they did vote it in All right thank Agreed. you that was it any other questions on a consent agenda Karen I, d I just have a comment I, I just want to thank the two people that made the donations to us yes. I think that's wonderful mm -hmm. the one parent yes. um, Brenda Singh who donated the 4,000 masks and the chestnut mobile Exxon for the $500 towards the science and math instruction very generous and I think that's very nice of them yep thank you agreed Mike um, just on, on the um, uh, policies that, that uh, I was looking over about the uh, about homeless children and, and what have you, um, are we being redundant? Aren't we? Uh, doesn't the, the the state and the county have its own policies? And are we? No, they were not. 
Uh, they may, but we're required under McKinney-Vento to have specific policies, and actually these two policies mix. Ms. Hecht um, actually is an expert on now. Um, some of the um, technical changes in them are due to an audit okay. in the area, so she can certainly speak to it, but yeah, we're required under. Yeah, I just under wanted to be sure that you know, we weren't pigeonholing ourselves by, by replicating what, what the state of the county is. That's a fantastic are. point, because we try to push as much of the responsibility off onto the right, county right. responsibility, because there's significant cost in some of these, right. and some of those are some pretty good tugs of war. Um, but there are some statutory elements that we are absolutely required for policy on. But it's a very good point because there is a little bit of an ebb and flow there with counties and our responsibilities too. So, Miss McKinney Vento down here knows all about <laughs> Miss. It's her middle name, Robin McKinney Vento Hecht. <laughs> so, is there is there like a quick summary of what really changed between the two documents? I was trying to read through it and find it, but I see the highlighted yellow. Is that the change? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. And that's it's an addition they're, or they're, a modification? They're, they're technical and it could be both. You're on it. Um, Robin can speak to it if you ask a specific question, because that's a pretty general question. Just. I, just, I guess the question is, is anything extensive here or just like some readjusting of wording or? For one of them, it's just the adjustment of the wording. And the other is that we had to add transportation policy. Add transportation. Policy. Speak to the microphone, Robin. You can. One was the transportation had to be added to it. The other is a word change. I see. Involvement okay. versus engagement. That's a. They requested that we change that word because they are changing it. I want to highlight that. Involvement versus engagement was a required change in the policy from state auditors. So that's the finite level on some of these elements that are highly regulated. Any other questions on a consent agenda? Okay, call the roll. James. Yes. Joanne. Yes. John Marrow. Yes. Mike. Yes. Karen. Yes. John. Yes. Cantone. And myself, yes. No recommended actions. Uh, does anybody have any new business? James. Um, last week was my first time, or last meeting, the in-person one was my first time sitting through the student of the month. Um, is it possible to highlight more students? Um, maybe one per grade, just in this time. It was nice to see the excitement from the parents, the students. Um, it's nice to, as Karen put it in the meeting notes from OXPA, for the Board of Ed to be a positive light in the community. Um, just something after being through it I thought might help. I, I love doing student month too. Um, if we did one in every grade, I'd love to, we'd probably run into a capacity issue, another frustration. Um, we definitely will back at Milton. <laughs> right, right, yeah, there's space issues there. But uh, when we have traditionally done them in the past, each of the three have brought sometimes 10, 12 people with that. You know, it's wonderful. It's so, it's, so, it's, uh, uh, it's goosebumps, you know, you get it's such a wonderful experience with it. So I, I we can do anything that the board wants. Um, I think doing 13 a month probably would present a challenge for us with space issues. Uh, it's not that we couldn't find them. So if that's the pleasure of the board, maybe that's something that, you know, even a, a subcommittee wanted to look at as far as how to recognize students. There's no magic or rhyme to it. This is the pro program that we have. You know, if there's a need for a subcommittee of the board to kind of, because it's really a board recognition, our teachers through our principals choose and we recognize them here. So doing more certificates, more time, it's up to the board, however you want to approach it. Does somebody, you want to work on that with some people? I'd be all for working on trying to figure out a way to recognize some more of our- Does Anybody want to work students? on that with James? I'd be interested in working on that. Karen, okay. And then you can, Mike, find, uh, you know, maybe either the principals or the assistant principals in each. Yeah. 
you know, and they can work as a group and, you know, as we, you know, obviously it's not going to change right away, but we can yeah. come up with something going forward. Give me a call the next few days and we'll schedule a time to gather on a Google Meet and, and get, some, get some ideas flowing. Sounds great. Thank you. Other new business. Okay. Uh, old business. So we have, oh, you have yeah. a new? Yeah. No, go ahead. You have a new business? I just, I just, no, old business. Okay. Uh, old business. So we have the, um, the issue over the $15, uh, the, the substitute and the certified and uncertified substitute teachers, which I have to tell you, I believe once we set a minimum rate, it would have trickled to everybody because it doesn't make any sense at all that we just don't have an hourly rate, but we don't. So um, that's what the attorney says, and that's so we got to re re deal with that. So uh, discussion. I, Karen. I I wouldn't be opposed to going for the um, increase for the 105 for the non-certified and then doing an additional 25 to 125 for the certified. That's it's like $2.85 an hour more, That's and you're giving both the same race, and it makes us more competitive, because I don't think we're gonna be, we're not the only ones I know looking at this. I know other people in the county are looking at this as well, and because I've gotten phone calls myself as to what um, our district that I work at pay. Which so I, I think that, um, this is something that everybody's looking at, and I think you're going to see numbers very different next year. And it, substitutes are extremely hard to get. And I think that we want to be, um, I think the 105 and the 125 is more than fair for what they're doing with our kids. Well, those numbers, are they $15 an hour times the hours? For the each? 105 is the 15 um, an hour, and then um, an extra 20 what you'd on basically top for the be doing is paying 285 more to a certified person. And would that equate to 15? It would uh, equate oh, to 17.85. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they both work seven hours. seven hours. It's it's based on a seven-hour day. Yeah. So, James, um, I'm all for increasing it. Um, I wouldn't be opposed if we went to say 110 for the uncertified and 132 um, came up with those because we were 20% more for a certified teacher compared to an uncertified teacher before. So to me, it makes sense. Either way, if it's 105 to 126 would be the 20% difference or 110 to 132. I think those numbers make sense in the current realm Mm -hmm. um, I don't hate the idea of paying our substitutes a higher rate than what we're paying minimum rate for Marlboro-wise for all the other positions. Okay, so we got two, two different proposals, but do we good, John? I got a question. I don't know if we know the answer for this. I should have asked this prior if you guys could have got this together. Do you know how much we spend a year in hiring substitutes roughly? Like, how much is this going to drive up cost? Uh, I can absolutely get that information. Um, two years ago, we did a pretty significant, maybe three years ago, we did a pretty significant analysis on it to see if there were some areas that we could tighten up some of our sub costs because there were some months where we were getting in the neighborhood of twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars a month in substitute costs. Mm -hmm. This year is an aberration in sub costs, so we've got a lot of ebbs and flows. Um, it's it's actually kind of a, it's, I mean, it really becomes a pleasure at a board. We we over budget for the subs because mm -hmm. no matter what, yeah, we have to get a sub if there's an absence. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely for increasing it. I just want to know like the overall impact on the budget, how it's going to affect. Because so, I know subs can become very expensive when you look at the entirety of the whole school year. Right. So J James, you said it was what was the percentage of increase? I didn't figure 20%. it. Twenty so. percent. It's what. 20. 20. Is it 20% differential or 20% increase? Uh, so it's a 20% differential right That's now. Differential. So, so if we're spending, if we're spending, say $20,000 a month on an average year for 20, for tw for 10 months, that's $200,000 and a 20, so it'd be about $40,000 a year to the budget. Mm -hmm. If, you know, if that number's right, Mike. Yeah. I, I mean, 
I warned precisely against this when when we uh, when we voted to uh, um, match the fast food workers fifteen dollar wage uh, fifteen dollars an hour is in no way a, a living wage uh, and in this district um, I consider uh, personally that that a lot of the, the substitute teachers are are um, auditioning if you will uh, for a district that does teach uh, um, take good care of its teachers and, and staff. I feel like, uh, I do feel that we're generous. Uh, I do feel that we could pivot in an emergency situation, such as we're, we're going through now with COVID, but to continue to have blanket increases um, across the board, um, and, and I think we're under some degree of duress with the way uh, the, the COVID is treating us right now, but I think it's a mistake. Okay. Well, we have uh, 183 school days. So even at, even, at the, even at the high rate of 132, you, it's still $24,000 if somebody were to work. Now, obviously, they would get holidays and stuff they work continually through, but, um, but just filling a full school year with a substitute in different spots, and it's not a continuous person, is $24,000. Right. So. Joanne? Uh, yeah, I have a question. I don't see Highland on here. Do we know, since Karen, you brought up Highland, what does Highland pay for a substitute teacher? They're looking at it and reviewing it right now. Well, what are they paying right now? They're less. They used to be. I'm at the top of my head. I can't, I, I don't know. I, I really don't know what the difference is off the top of my head. So how going, could you going say Going way back, going I remember up? they weren't less than Marlboro. Back 12 years, 13 years right. ago, and I was we subbing. Less with they were less. I mean, yeah, I'm, across the board, they are, so yeah. I would, I would yeah. assume yeah. they are. I mean, at this point, like, I even said that when we went to the $15, that this would happen. Um, that would bring, if we're doing $132, that's higher than any other district in Orange and Ulster County. I mean, I'll do the 120 if I have to, and um, 110 for the uncertified. But I got to tell you, I'm not going higher than that because that's that's crazy. I don't see anybody else willing. You know, Karen keeps saying people are talking about it, but nobody's doing anything. Even Warwick is $90 a day and $100 a day. And I'm looking at even Goshen, which is a larger district than us, is 100 and 110. Newburgh is 105 and 115. And those are much larger districts than us. And right now we're worried about money. And here we go. So, I mean, I'm willing to go, like I said, 110 and even 115 like Newburgh and, and match with them. This way we can stay on the same scale. But $130, that's way over my budget. It and my breaks. second and final question. I'm sorry, James. Yeah. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> I, it just... If we went to 132, it's eighteen dollars and eighty-five cents an hour. Like for certified teachers in our buildings, that is still grossly underpaying them. Mm -hmm. Just well, then you as better, someone, then you better tell every other district that you're underpaying them because well, then no but, one's going to go work for but them. But the reality of it is, we only have to worry about us. So that's the that well, like that's said, when that's we're having the these, and no district. one, no other district has, or these are updated from BOCES. Yeah. This isn't all of the school board or most of them are probably having similar conversations because everyone's minimum wage went up this year. Right. So it's something that every school district is looking at. But it, it didn't go up to $15 an hour. It went up to twelve forty, and it went up to $13. We went up to 15 When was the last Other school time? districts are not following us. When was the last time that these salaries were increased? Last year. Uh, that's a very good question. It, it's been this rate since I've been here. So at yeah. least so five years. Obviously six, six years. years. No longer. So this I'm is what I was paid when I subbed here a long time that. ago. Yeah. So yeah. we're talking close to 15 years. Minimum. Yeah, about. I would say. And I, yeah. I know a lot of the districts are reviewing this right now. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I really don't think that it's a, that extravagant for us to consider increasing this, especially so, when we're looking for people to come in and work with our biggest treasure, and they could work at. Um, some people can work at. I'm trying to think of a fast food place. None of them are coming to my brain right now. That's Dunkin' good. Donuts, thank you, um, for, for, for 15 an hour. No, and they might not. consider they're, that less stress. 
I, we want to get the good candidates. And there is a big difference between, you know, the, I, I believe the non-certified, do they have to have any kind of, what's the education level for non-certified? Do they have to just high school diploma? High, or school, it, high school diploma. And right. then your certified staff is usually a master's degree. There's a big difference. At least bachelor's. At least bachelor's, bachelor's master's. So and they, they can only work 20 days out of the year. Who can? Uncertified teachers no, and paraprofessionals they, they, can only work 20 to 30 days It used out of to the be year. 90 days, and that's been waived. Yeah. So yeah. it's 90. It's my, 90. My, my other question so is um, yeah. how hard is it in a normal year to fill the sub roles when people are looking, you know what I mean? When people are calling out, are you having times where you don't fill the positions because you're not paying enough? Is that an issue that you guys are concerned about? Um, that's a real hard one to quantify. We absolutely right. have... Um, substitute openings that we can't fill and it's um it's really a a, a tight labor pool it's mm -hmm. a hard job and right. um for some it's a scary job yeah you know mm -hmm. we we see some nice migration where someone starts in as a teaching assistant substitute or maybe in food service starts to get comfortable with the system and then moves themselves up to mm -hmm. an uncertified sub um, I know we try to cultivate as much as possible. So there's no concrete way for me to say it's because of the rate yeah. uh, versus here you go. We want you to take care of 20 kids, 23 <laughs> little crumb crunchers and tie their shoes every day. Listen, so um, I won't go back. I won't go right. back. <laughs> I won't sub again. It's not an easy job. John. If you bring a non-certified teacher to $15 an hour, that's $105 a day, $525 a week. So there probably could be, there should be a differential between certified. We don't necessarily have to carry the same 20%. I know we, it's that way now, but we could vary that. And just a point of comparison, the maximum unemployment in New York State is $505 a week. So. At $100 a day, you can actually make more money on unemployment. <laughs> Just a sure. point of reference that for, for, for professional substitutes, you, you know, you can actually make more money not working. I, and I know it compares to the rest of the districts, but again, like somebody mentioned, that's all going to be reviewed now with, a, with the minimum wage coming across the board across the state. For a point so, of interest, those substitutes that choose to apply for unemployment we have work for you if you're on our books and applying for unemployment. We will contest that unemployment claim. It may take us months, but we have won some of those claims. So yeah, the, the only problem with that is that was pre-COVID, yeah. and now with the new regulations that it's have come out, gonna be somebody, somebody, somebody can choose to go and get unemployment yeah. and, because they have a fear of COVID and we can't do anything about it. Well, we have filed, and it's months in the queue, and whether we win or not. Well, but, but I mean, that's just the that new executive order, so that's, that's gonna be a problem. I wasn't bringing it up to compare yeah. us paying them yeah. unemployment, but it was more just a comparison yeah. of yep. just where these rate wages are compared to, yeah. you know. So um, we've seen, we're in a couple different spots here. Um, I understand what James was saying, where the regular, where our regular people are making the 105, so we're giving it, you, you're proposing we give an extra five dollars for an uncertified, and then the and then the difference would be on the whether we do 125 or 132 to, to keep the differential. Um, so your proposal is 110 and 132, correct? Correct. Okay. I'm just looking to see where we're at. Joanne, if we do a motion, it, are you in, would you be in favor of a motion like that? I don't want to do 12 motions. I'm trying to see where we can get a consensus. No. Okay. John? It's going to net out $20,000. I would be in favor of it. Mike? No. Karen? No. I just want to be clear. The minimum for the, the wage for the non-certified is how much? Would be 110, is, the, is what we're talking about. I, yeah, but where did that come from? I mean, if you do James, it, James said because the general person that we hire oh, okay. is making 105, so we're asking him to be teaching a class, 
So we're saying 110. To differentiate between the non-teaching person. Right. Okay, I got you. Yeah. I, did, I didn't understand that because I was doing the yeah. math. Substitute yeah. paraprofessional right now yeah. working making the same hours would get the same as a substitute teacher. I see what you mean. Right. Okay. So, so I understand I mean, that. Actually, uncertified teacher should get 105, yeah. Hmm. But it's Question not. to me? Yeah, well, yeah, we, we're going through because we got to try. I, I can all, only want to do one motion, so I'm trying to figure out, you know, if if the 110, 132 is not going to fly, then um, is it the other one was 105, 125, 105, 125, and we had 110 and 125. So I'm trying to, you know, the 105 is what we're paying everybody right now. So, but. I mean, it, the, that's the question to you, John. Is the, the higher one is the 110, 132, or then if we don't have four people in favor, then we'll go back and go to the next. Yeah. Your mic's on. Hold, hold on. We're waiting to see what John's. Yeah, I, I, logically, I think that makes sense to have some differentiation of the teaching personnel versus non instruction. We, I, we can't hear him. Yeah, you get, I'm sorry. I took this was on. I said I think it makes sense to make the differential if we're going to do this for teaching personnel versus non-teaching yeah. personnel. I mean, we opened it up. We, we, we opened it up to $15 a minimum. These are now exposed because they were in contract rates and the, the, the hourly rate didn't apply. So if we're going to be fair and be consistent in, what we, in our approach that we've had for years, which is a differential between instructional and non-instructional, and we're going to incorporate $15 an hour at a minimum. Uh, what James says is making a little more sense to me anyway. As much as I don't like this, you know, these increases, and we, we also maybe uh, want to look at this, what it really means in the full dollars of a year, on an average year, on a regular year, this year it's going to be a warped or uh, skewed. But <clears throat> I'm inclined to agree with it because it's... Like I said, it's logical and it's consistent in what we've been doing. And what were you more comfortable with, Karen? I was more comfortable with just a 105, 125, because it was a $25 increase to both. But I understand where James is coming from, and I'm flexible on this, because I really do think it needs to be a raise. I'm just not sure we need to go to the highest in the county and be the first to do that. So, yeah. uh, The only thing I wanted to say with that is um, we see a teacher shortage coming it's looming we all know it we're all aware that the students aren't going to college for teaching at the same rate they did previously and the programs so are closed. if we can be we i know we are a fairly teacher friendly contract but pre-contract when you're auditioning as mike had put it Right now, we're last on that list of places people want to go because $80 a day is a lot less than 100 to 105. And realistically, with the minimum wage keep going up, my wife, when she substituted 14 years ago, all of these rates were the same. Um, minimum wage has gone up. I know that is a point of contention, but we don't have a choice in that. And we, I do believe, want to be attracting the best substitutes to our district this would be a model that could potentially do that and as karen said i do believe a lot of the school districts are going to be following suit so um, th this is also something that um, i call it correct sizing because it's not something that we've done in about 15 years um, with the salaries so we could adjust it and then we can look at it again in a year and adjust it even more after we hear what the other districts are doing too so in, instead of doing that, because you just said all the districts are looking at this, Karen, so why don't well, we not, table don't this all, right but now? There's quite a few. Well, why don't we just table this right now and find out what everybody else is going to do and see before we make a decision, because you just brought this up saying the other districts are looking. So I'd like to see where Highland's going to go, because you said Highland's looking at this. And I'd like to see where they're going to go. I know Newburgh is not looking at it. Um, so I'd like to see what other districts are actually looking at it and how far they're going to go and what they're going to pay. Because um, I think, again, we're going over the top. And I think there are a lot of children that are in school 
for teaching. They're, on, they're online and they're virtual. Um, we have a lot of students that are coming back and being substitutes right now for us, which is great because they know our, our students. But and all they know of the, the statistics teachers. are right. telling us we are going to have a teacher shortage within the next five years. I, That's, I, I, all of the statistics are saying that. Well, okay, Mike. And, and if you want, I'll go to the 132, 110. I'll, I'll flip okay, hold on one second. Yeah. Mike. Not only are we going to have a, a teacher shortage, but our student enrollment is declining. Okay, and we're, we're presumably we're looking forward. I mean, we're looking at uh, the, the, the whole COVID nightmare ending or beginning to subside with, with uh, herd immunities, vaccines, so on and so forth. I, you know, I'm just worried that we're in a position now where we're concerned about our, our state revenue stream, we're concerned about taxpayer revenue stream, we're concerned about roasting in the power plants. This is no time to be increasing our spending, and we started it with that $15, and I knew this was going to blow up because you have, uh, I, I, I don't know if it's the tier three or whatever, is it 15, 10, and they just saw one and two go up to 10 cents below them, and then they're gonna come back to us and say, hey, wait a minute, we're only 10 cents after three years, now we need more money, and this is gonna be a never-ending cycle, Correct. all right? Yeah. I agree with Joanne, let's just, just back off for now, let's see how things evolve, and if, if we find that we're in a position where we have a dire need and a dire shortage, we could impose a short-term relief program to get those teachers we need, and then once we have a good idea as to where our revenue is, we can make our expenses match that. Um, do you want to make a motion, James? Uh, yes, I move that we increase the non-certified teacher rate to $110 per day and the certified teacher rate to $132 per day. Second. Oh, okay, hold on one second. And uh, effective February 8th. Effective February 8th because we don't, we don't want it to, whether it was back or forward, you know, we pick a date in there. Second. Okay, Karen is a second. Any further discussion? Again, I'm gonna say because our community, people are losing their homes. Minimum wage is not up to, in this area, up to $15 an hour. I think we're jumping the gun and I don't think we're gonna see other well, districts do it. And that, but, Joanne, you, you, know. you keep saying minimum wage isn't up to $15 an hour. The current rate, if you get hired at a fast food restaurant in this county, is fourteen dollars and fifty cents. On July right. first, on July first, she's correct. The minimum yeah. wage now is twelve and change. No, right? correct. she's correct. I, the I minimum right. wage, according to New York State, I'm looking at the Labor Department. It depends on which area you're in, Frank. It's not the rest of New York State. Current, if you're working no. in a fast food restaurant, is Fourteen dollars and fifty cents, no, and as of July first, it goes to fifteen dollars. The rest of the state was for the other areas. So we, it's right off the New York State website. Mm -hmm. Well, then they better take down their signs for thirteen dollars and seventy-five cents up here. You know, and after 12. listening to Mike, I, I kind of inclined to to wait. I, I don't. I don't know if the urgency is really here right now. I, I just. I do think we ought to step back on this and and look at it maybe in totality in terms mm -hmm. of how much it's going to really cost us and and if we need some short term relief, we can we can do that, right? I mean, it's it's with COVID, it's yeah, all it's wide open right now, and and I know I just went against what I just said in terms of logic, but. Um, it, I, I'm afraid of the snowball effect that, that uh, right. Michael just said is if you start looking at contracts and they start to have gaps mm -hmm. and we're potentially in negotiations in some of those we might open that stuff up too. Uh, right. I, I'm, I mean we're going to vote on this but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of inclined to change what my initial thought was just I'm not saying it, it it's not fair to do something I just don't know if we need to do it tonight. Okay. This needs to be looked at. And I don't really, it, it's, if it gets passed tonight, great. If it doesn't and it gets tabled till later, it's just something that we can't forget about. It's got to be something that's looked at and passed eventually. Well, I, I think I, I do looking at what other people are doing is great for this. What we're talking about is getting at least our people, we're talking $5 a day more than any other substitute we currently are hiring. We're paying our substitutes less now than we are our aides. That, that's been the discussion. 
So uh, we'll call the roll and go from there. James. Yes. Joanne. No. John Marrow. Yes. Mike Connors. No. Karen Brooks. Yes. John Cantone. No. And myself, yes. Motion carries 4-3. Any other old business? Oh, I have yes, John. I almost forgot what all that conversation um, it, Somebody brought it up already, too. Like, we at one time we were talking about the doing something about Monday and trying to adjust the inequities with the cohorts when certain vacation days or holidays fall and then one cohort doesn't get to go to school in person as, he, as much as the other one does. Are we at a point where we can, number one, look at that, and number two, look at the two cohorts together if the population is low enough in school now where you can actually bring them together on the same day and that's a question i don't know if we should or not but yeah the second item we can't do we need to save those seats for children if they don't come there are certainly instances especially when we were uptight against a uh, the holiday where there was a lot of absenteeism because kids were staying online instead of coming to school that's increasing now um those students that are enrolled in our hybrid program we can't just give away their seat and we're not opening enrollment but um so so really that's that's a complete disruptor okay um as far as the monday piece you know that's something that is um certainly uh can be part of the dialogue it's something i think that we should um, slow roll into because of impact we do have a pretty good clean system of quality right now and sometimes unintended consequences are um, giving up that planning and development time on Monday um, you know it's it's listen there, there's no perfect science here so yes you'll gain some instructional days because we could flip-flop Mondays every other Monday is hybrid a hybrid B and and finish out the school year like that one of the questions that we would want to ask ourselves is what is the unintended consequence of that of what time is used on monday for professional development for meetings for preparation um, we have saved a significant amount of money in professional development because of the work that we do on mondays too so you know there's no perfect answer i guess is what i'm saying john mm -hmm. there's no absolute perfect answer to it but there is to the second question it's 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 too disruptive to completely alter that. So I think that that really is inherent in my initial dialogue about we need relief from the departments of health and leadership in our state. As more and more of our adults get vaccinated, we need to see the fruits of that as an institutional benefit so that we can reduce the amount of time that those that are con uh, um, vaccinated have to quarantine and maybe get to a point where enough of our staff is vaccinated that we can have our children back in our hallways more. I'm still holding out hope that that's in the 2021 school year. But we can't make that change without some real authority change. Superintendents are putting tremendous pressure right now on local and state departments of health that they have to look at their rules. I respect that departments of health right now are in a very acute situation looking at the tree and can't see the forest because they are triaging the effort to vaccinate and test our population. We need them to look at what does March, what does April, what does May look like because we need to plan. We can't be a Thursday night PowerPoint, change it for Monday. It just, it, it doesn't work. Well, and I think to that, to that point, um, Westchester and Duchess are doing it totally different Correct. than they are in Rockland, Orange, and Ulster. Right. Um, that's where the big issues are happening with these closures and the amount of people being put out because of the close contact. You know, Ulster was good for a while and then flopped to this new thing where, yep, one person in the room is positive, everybody's out. The mic drop moment for us. Last week, our middle school and high school were closed in-person learning. We had 51 staff members on quarantine because of the rules we had to follow. 
if we were following the Duchess rules that are in place right now, it would have been between 12 and 15 staff members between the two schools, and both schools would have been open. Wow. The fact is one person-to-person -person transfer of COVID has occurred in our schools in a year. One. That's yes. Good. One. We've had, obviously, infections. You get my letters. <laughs> but transfer of COVID from person to person, we've had one. So uh, I'm passionate about this, folks. We need a rules change from our leadership. It's not something that we can control. So I'll get off my soapbox again. So all, all fair points, Mike, good points. I, I think maybe it sounds like we're probably not in a position to really make a change now. But I do think we need to just consider how often it happens where one of the two cohorts like loses a day or two just because of the way the calendar falls and holidays. I know it's really difficult now because we've had so many days that are between snow day. Yeah, and we're going to get into that role now of the, the delays and the, and the snow yeah, days and all that. So it does get a little choppy and messy. I understand. I, 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 maybe I'm thinking out loud now, but it's, but the, when there's truly like the holidays, I think is the one where you can plan around. I don't know. I just hate to see certain ones just missing out because it just falls that way. You know? And that is the reason why we chose Monday. Some districts chose Wednesdays mm -hmm. because many, I think it's seven Mondays are, are holidays or something to that effect. It's a, it's a large number, but mm -hmm. uh, listen, there's no perfect science here. All right. All right. I guess any other old business or other items? Okay. Uh, recognition of district residents. Uh, executive session. Uh, we have a proposed executive session for the employment history of particular persons and collective bargaining negotiations. Uh, there will be action after the executive session. And I have a motion. Karen, second. John Cantone. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you, everybody. We'll see you in two weeks.